Glad that you are here. <laughs> yeah, good try. No, it's good. Like I said, I'm glad you guys like each other. That's, that's not a bad thing to have in a church by any means. The other thing that we want to do is we want to make sure that we are uh, engaging with others and that connecting with others. Again, the Great Commission is, is the thing that we want to have, uh, that we want to embrace. We want to be followers of that. Uh, we want to engage with someone on a regular basis, on a weekly basis. Uh, you may have to be a little more innovative. If you are retired and you don't uh, get out as much as you used to, uh, you might want to be engaged in, in connecting with others a little bit more, and so it might be a more of a, a intentional thing. But, but the hope is that you do connect with people, that you do talk with people, that you do invite people, and not just to church, but also on a regular basis as far as uh, at your workplace or whether you're having coffee or dinner or just interacting with people online. I know I'm still trying to get my head around the idea that a lot of the young adults, they, whenever I ask them, have you had a chance to talk with someone this week? They went, yeah. And I said, well, what do they have to say? They said, well, they was online. And I'm like... How do you have a conversation online? But they, they have multiple chat rooms lined up that they have ongoing conversations with. So I'm still trying to get my head around uh, that. And they seem very happy and very content to do it that way. So that's, that's all right if that's the way you want to do it. Well, we're talking about Easter. Uh, we're going into Easter season. And one of the things that I want to try to uh, give to you today is what, what does it take for us to be believers in Christ, what does it take for someone to come to faith? But also, I uh, want to give you some prep, uh, as much material as possible. And that's why you have the outline. That's why you have the fill in the blank. That's why you have things that, that are beneficial for you uh, to try to get things resonating inside of you. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But first, I want to share with you a quick video from Frank Turek, uh, crossexamined.org. Uh, you'll recognize him when you see him. But he's going to talk about four uh, four reasons why Christianity is true. Some things that maybe as you have conversations with people that you can share these things uh, and feel more confident about as you're sharing. Again, don't worry about trying to memorize it, but just have the general knowledge, general information that you can pass along to someone. And I think it'll be helpful. Um, I look at this stuff and it's always, it always encourages my faith. It always helps me move in, in a more positive direction. So I hope it'll be beneficial for you. And then we'll talk about a little bit more about what it is that we believe in terms of Easter, uh, why we believe in the cross and the resurrection, and I think it'll be helpful. So thanks, Marcus. The reason that we believe Christianity is true is because the answer to four questions is yes. How about the first question, does truth exist? Obviously, you hear people say all the time, there is no truth, or you got your truth, I got my truth, all truth is relative. When somebody says there is no truth, you ought to ask that person a question. You ought to say, is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true, but it claims to be true. In other words, it's a self-defeating claim. Of course there's truth. If there was no truth, an atheist couldn't be right that there was no God. So there is truth. Question number two, does God exist? There are several arguments for the existence of God. Let me just give you one. Even atheists today are admitting that space, matter, and time had a beginning out of nothing. Well, think about this, friends. If space, matter, and time had a beginning out of nothing, whatever created space, matter, and time can't be made of space, matter, and time. Now, when you think about a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent cause, who do you think of? God. Now, we don't know it's the Christian God at this point, but we know it's a theistic God, a being who's beyond the world, who created the world. The third question is, are miracles possible? Obviously, Christianity can't be true if miracles are not possible. But the greatest miracle in the Bible has already occurred, and we have scientific evidence for it. What's that? I just mentioned it. The creation of the universe out of nothing. If Genesis 1-1 is true, every other verse in the Bible is at least possible. Because if there's a being that can create the universe out of nothing, can he do whatever he wants inside the universe? If he can create the whole show out of nothing? Of course, he can resurrect Jesus from the dead or walk on water or part the Red Sea. He can do any of that. So the final question, the fourth question, which gets us all the way to the Christian God is, is the New Testament reliable enough to show us that Jesus rose from the dead? The reason we believe in Christianity is because an event occurred, the resurrection. 
Now, I have to ask you this. Why would the Jewish writers of the New Testament, all were Jewish with the exception of Luke, why would they invent a resurrected Jesus? Why would they say that a man who claimed to be God rose from the dead if it didn't happen? They thought that would be blasphemy for a man to claim to be God. And why would they invent a resurrected Jesus? They already thought they were God's chosen people. They had no motive to invent a resurrected Jesus. And certainly they could not have invented it in Jerusalem where an empty tomb existed. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, the New Testament writers did not create the resurrection. The resurrection created the New Testament writers. There would be no New Testament if it wasn't for the resurrection. Now, even if the New Testament never existed, Christianity would still be true. Why? Because Christianity is based on an event, the resurrection. Do you realize there were thousands of Christians before a line of the New Testament was ever written? Why? Because an event occurred, the resurrection. You have to have more faith to believe it didn't occur than it did. And if God exists, and he does, and can create the universe out of nothing, then he can certainly resurrect Jesus from the dead. That's why we believe in Christianity. So again, that's uh, Frank Turek, crossexamined.org. There we go. Thanks, Marcus. And, uh, and I, like I said, I take advantage of those guys all the time. The other thing that I want to call your attention to, if you want to do a case of, uh, do some reading, is there's a book uh, called The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus by Gary Habermas and Mike Lacona. They are considered to be kind of the world experts on the resurrection. And they talk about the resurrection of Jesus, not from a scientific standpoint, but from a historical standpoint. Some people say, well, you can't prove... Uh, you know, I won't believe in Jesus until you prove the resurrection happened scientifically. Well, you can't prove something historically, scientifically, because scientifically you have to be able to repeat the event in order to assess it. You know, uh, historically you can't do that. You know, we just keep getting older every day. So, uh, but you can, you can evaluate things historically, and that's what they do. And they just go through all the objections and all the events and give all the criteria and all the facts and all the figures. And the scriptures and, and history really su supports uh, the resurrection of Jesus uh, really well. So we're going to talk about what does it take to be a believer. And uh, according to your notes, you'll see in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes to the church in Corinth. Uh, the, the first written account of the resurrection is written about 25 years after the resurrection, and it predates the Gospels. All the epistles, all the letters by the apostles, they predate the Gospels. The Gospels are written probably around 60 AD, 70 AD. Some people even go into the 80s and 90s. But, uh, but all the letters were written. So this is really kind of the first written uh, account of the resurrection that we have. Now, the account of the resurrection was very, very vibrant and very much alive in oral culture, which was very much a part of their world. But Paul writes this down so that these people in Corinth would be able to know for sure and that they would have this written uh, verification of what, what they believed and what Jesus was all about. So Paul says, for what I received, I passed on to you of first importance. So he says, I got this, I received it. After his, uh, his coming to faith on Damascus Road, he spent three years kind of doing other stuff. And they went to Jerusalem. And he met with Peter, James, and John. And they shared with him the stories of Jesus, first hand account of Jesus. And so he says, that which I received... I'm going to give to you. Now, that's an important lesson for us because what we receive, that's what we give. What you've received, what your story is, what lessons you've learned, those are the things that you give to others. So do not discount what you know and what you do not know because what you don't know is just as valuable as what you do know, right? So ignorance is bliss. No, I'm just saying that... That your story is valuable, so don't discount that. So Paul says, uh, I, I pass these things on to you as of first importance, and here is the first important thing, that Christ died for our sins. As we come into the Easter season, it's important for us to know what it's all about. Jesus died for us so that we might have relationship with God. He died for my sins. He died for me, he died for you, and he died for the people that we don't like or care about or know. 
Jesus died for all of our sins so that we might have relationship with him. That's part of the Easter message that we share with others. And the thing is, we don't just share it at Easter. We share it throughout the year. The story. And so Paul says, this is of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now when he says scriptures, he means the Old Testament. So, so the Jesus and the apostles, they all valued the Old Testament. In our day and age, our people are trying to walk away from uh, the Old Testament is that it's out of date, you know, it doesn't have application, you know. There are ways, there are things for us to learn from it. There are principles and precepts that are very much alive and that God repeats in the New Testament. So they said according to the scriptures. So that's what they believed and the, the prophecies about Jesus is what he's alluding to. That Jesus was buried, he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And they appeared to Cephas, meaning Peter, and then to the twelve, meaning the twelve apostles. <clears throat> and after that he appeared to more than 500, more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me, Paul uh, meaning himself, uh, as to one abnormally born. So you have this idea, and this is wonderful, one of the wonderful passages of Scripture that I think everyone should have highlighted in their Bibles. If you don't, I encourage you to do so because it really does sum up this idea and this concept about what it is that we believe and what we need to share with people. So this morning, I'm going to just kind of go over some things for you. Some, of, some of you, maybe most of you, it's a review. For some of you, it might be new stuff. But what does Jesus do for us on the cross? Why is the cross so venerated? Why is the cross hated? And uh, why, does, why is it that we, we are people of the cross and that we value what Jesus did? The first thing in Colossians chapter 2, Paul writes to the church in Colossae. He says that Christ has canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken all the junk and garbage away from us, nailing it to the cross. So all of our sin has been nailed to the cross. We, 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 we buy into that concept. In 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds you have been healed. The idea there is that because of what Jesus did and that he took his, our sins upon himself, we are then set free to live a different life. Yeah. We are set free to live a life to where we can pursue God without without worry, without concern, without anxiousness. You know that Christianity is the only religion in the world where God pays the price for people to be right with him. Christianity is the only, is the only uh, uh, religion in the world where God builds a bridge for you to cross over to know him and be certain that when you die, you enter into eternity with him. All other religions are based upon your effort, your, uh, your hope that you're good enough, that you've done enough, that you've, you've lived a, a, a good enough life and done enough deeds to earn the, 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 whoever God you're serving to the right to come into an eternal life or an eternal existence with him. But Christianity clarifies and de de declares to us that Jesus does all these things so that we can have that confidence that surety of what it is that God is that God loves us and cares for us and wants us to uh, in, inherit His uh, be in His presence and inherit all the things that, that Christ has made available for us. In Galatians three thirteen, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it's written, "Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole." So He nails our sins to the cross. He bears our sins in His body. He becomes a curse for us. And then Matthew eight. 17 says, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. So Jesus takes every bit of junk and garbage upon himself on our behalf so that we might be set free to, to live life and to love God and to not, be, not live life in a way that we're uncertain about what it is that God, how God feels about us. We know that we become the children of God. 
loved by a loving Father who cares for us and welcomes us and in, in, implores us to reach out to others who don't know him and share that good news with people who don't know Jesus. 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ also suffered, suffered once for all the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body but made alive in the spirit. That Jesus died once. He doesn't die repeatedly. You are not crucifying Jesus over and over and over again. Jesus died once to, to make the path for us to experience God. He carries our sins. In Romans 5, 6, it says, you see, at just the right time when we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. See, it's not about what you can do or what someone else can do to appease God. Jesus pays the price so that we can be at peace with God while we, were, while we were powerless. I love what Isaiah 64, 6 says. It says, all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Your righteousness, my righteousness, it's all just filthy rags. It doesn't amount to anything. Now, this is important to know because there are people who will think that, well, I really don't need God. I think I'm good enough. I think I'm all right. I think if I just treat people well, and if I'm morally good, and if I'm ethically good, and if I give enough money to this charity or this thing, then that will cover whatever needs to be covered. But the scripture tells us that our righteous acts are like filthy rags. That all have sinned and fall short of God's great glory, of God's glorious standard. It's important for us to keep this one in mind because for people who think well, I'm good enough or I'm okay or I'm all right, for us to be able to tell them, you know, that's, that's a good way to think or that's okay for you to think, but that's not what the Bible says. That's not what God says. And when the Bible says it, it's equivalent to, to that's what God says. Okay? We need, we need to put the power back into the word of God. We need to, to recognize that when God's word, the Bible speaks, God put it there to tell us something, to teach us, to instruct us, and that it has authority to it. And so to let people know that God loves them, but that God says, if you try to do it on your own, your efforts are as filthy rags and they won't get you anywhere. Well, they won't get you anywhere with God. They'll get you moving in the wrong, other direction. Does that make sense? Okay, so the second thing is, what does the blood of Jesus mean? What's that all about? In Matthew 26, 28, so we talked about the cross, we're talking about the blood. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus pours out for many, for the whole world. John three sixteen, God's love of the world. And so we need to keep that in mind, that Jesus' desire is that, uh, that forgiveness for sins would be for Everybody. Romans 5, 9, since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Justified, sanctified, redeemed, uh, salvation. All those, things, all those things are blanket statements, and they're meant to give us the idea that when I come to Christ, God washes me and makes me right before God, and he justifies me. So justification stands. I stand legally before God clean. When I'm sanctified, I'm set apart to be God, to be holy. Not set up on a shelf to be sanctified and don't touch. You know, we got those figurines. we got grandkids, by the way. Uh, we, we got those things that don't touch grandma's stuff. <laughs> and if you have grandkids or children, you know that that doesn't mean a thing. Okay? And so, so God, God has sanctified us so that we are made holy because of God, not to be set up and not never used or touched. He sanctifies us. He makes us holy so that we could be used for his glory because of what Jesus has done for us. Because it's never about my righteousness. My righteousness is filthy rags. But because of Jesus, he turns... My, uh, all, though your sins be as scarlet, they will be white as snow. And so he, he makes me clean. And so he cleans me up. He sanctifies me. He, he justifies me. So I'm no longer legally uh, in debt uh, because of sin. I am, I am made clean and right. And so the blood of Jesus covers me and washes me. 
I'm justified by his blood. In 1 John 1, 7, this is, there's some conditions on this. He says, but if we walk in the light as Jesus is in the light. So again, there's that conditional word if. So I have a choice to make. I can either follow after Jesus or not. And if I don't follow after Jesus, then I'm probably not living a Christian life. Okay. Christians, Christians live an active faith. I'm going to challenge you a little bit now. Christians live an active faith. If our faith isn't active, we're probably not Christian. It's probably going to get some remarks on YouTube or something like that, if anyone watches. So, I mean, the, the Christian faith is, is active. And so here, if we walk in the light as he is in light, uh, so a benefit comes. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. The blood purifies us. He purifies us at salvation, and he continues to purify us on a regular basis. Jesus is always at work, purifying you, convicting us of sin, righteousness, and judgment, drawing us into a relationship with him. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does that? It's the blood of Jesus. He washes us. He cleanses us. He covers us. He, he is over us. That's what atonement means, to cover us. And so he, he does all that with his blood. And so there's power in the blood. We used to sing that song, the old song, there's power, there's power, wonder-working power in the blood of Jesus, right? It's going through your head right now. I've lost you for the rest of the sermon. So, but the idea is that there is power. There is power in the blood, and we need to keep that in mind. The blood of Jesus washes me clean. As I mentioned before, though your sins be as scarlet, you'll be white as snow because of what Jesus does. And God pours out because of his blood. He gives us grace, and he gives us mercy. And that grace and that mercy means unearned, unmerited favor of God so that, that God applies to us, gives to us, so that we can give to others. And that's why the Christian faith is an active faith. It, it, it's an engaging faith. It's something that God has sent us to be Christ's ambassadors to people, to our world, to be engaged with our world. And if ever our world need, needed active Christian faith, it's now. If ever our nation needed Christians to rise up and be active in their faith, vocal in their faith, it's now. We need to be people who speak out in truth. And we live in a, in, a, in a culture that wants to cancel us, wants to shove us off to the side, wants to uh, call us intolerant. And we need to be people who are filled with the grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the wisdom of God, the discernment of God. We need all that stuff that God has for us that we receive from him so that we can engage with the culture in a way that gives us the right words to say at the right time, that gives us boldness and gives us courage. That was extra. That's not in the notes. That's just free for you. All right. One of the key verses is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, so that no one can say, look what I did. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. If you don't have this uh, highlighted in your Bible, I really encourage you to do so because this is, you know, I, I have a set of scriptures that I just go to in my head when I'm in conversations with people. I don't always quote the, the, the verse reference when I'm talking to someone, but I'll, I'll get the message out to somebody that God, God reaches out to us. It's by his grace, the power of grace. Why is grace powerful? Because the blood is powerful. Because the cross is powerful. And we live it. And we experience it on a day-by-day -day basis. Some days we're doing really good in our Christian faith. Some days we're struggling. And some days we're tanking. You know, it's just, it's just, not, it's just not filling up very well. But the reality is that God, the, God's work on the cross and God's work through the blood still works whether we're feeling it or not, whether we're doing a good thing. Because, again, it's not by my works of righteousness, but it's but because of what Jesus has done for me. So let, let God be at work in your heart, in your life. And this is the message that we share with others, that God's grace reaches out to them. Ephesians 1, 7 says, in, in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. 
God's grace. I, I skipped a few points. Excuse me. Just let me zip up a minute. Jesus' blood washes my sins away. Jesus' blood continues to wash my sins away. And so on a regular basis, God is at work. And then 1 Corinthians 6.11 uh, I love this passage. First, uh, yeah, I'm glad I went back because I don't want to miss it. First Corinthians 6, if you haven't read the passage, uh, the, the preceding verses, Paul lays out a whole list of things of how deplorable and despicable the people of Corinth are. You know, you guys are abusers, you're you know, sexually immoral, you're, you, know, you worship other gods. I mean, he just goes through this whole list and he says, and that's what you guys were. That's what you were. And he says, but you're not that way anymore. Because he goes on to say, but you were washed and you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Why? Because Jesus died for our sins on the cross and his blood washes us clean. There's power in the blood. There's power in the cross. And we need to be messengers of, of that story to people who don't know Jesus. Again, God reaches out to people who are, um, some of you guys like to fish, right? Come on, let me see the hands. How many of you like to fish? fish. Dave, I'm looking for your hand there. Okay. I was looking for that one. Yeah, I know. I know these guys. You guys got pictures to prove it. I know that. The thing is, is that you don't clean up the fish until after you catch it. Right? You know, the thing is, so, so we need to not be thinking about people who, who are all messed up. You know, about, oh, well, I don't know if I should share with them because, you know, they, they don't have it together. Maybe when they get their act a little bit better together, then they'll talk to them about Jesus. No, 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 no. We talk to them when they're all messed up because everyone's messed up. Again, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've, we've all messed up. And so we share the story of the cross. We share the story of the blood of Jesus, that he's able to, to remove all that junk from our lives. He's able to help us move past all that stuff and re- enter into a relationship with God in, in a loving manner. We can be called the children of God, the people who belong to God. That's what God wants us to do. Okay, now I'm zipping back down to where I'm supposed to be. First Peter 1 Peter 1.18, For you know it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. It's all because of, of, of the blood. And then I don't, con- I, I don't continue to pursue sin and take Jesus' dying for me for granted. I don't abuse grace. One of the things that we keep in mind is what Romans, Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we keep on going on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means... We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Because of what Christ has done for me, I value grace. I value mercy. I value the fact that my sins are washed away, that Jesus bore my sins. And because of that, I live and follow after him. I do not go back into sinful behavior. And when I am tempted to do so, I ask God to help me turn from that. And God changes the course of direction. And that's where a lot of us help one another become accountable, to, to be confidants, to be counselors, to be people who, who encourage each other to follow after Jesus. I, put, I work to put off the sinful nature, according to Colossians 2.11, saying no to sin. Why? Because I value what Christ has done for me, and I don't want to be someone who says, oh, I'm saved, therefore I, can, I just do whatever I want to do. No, because I value what God has done. I'm aware of what God has done. I want God to create in me a new heart, a new life, and follow after him. And Colossians, is the, Paul uses the illustration of how we need to put on righteousness and take off sinfulness. He uses the illustration of just putting off a cloak and t- putting on a cloak. This idea that I have the will to say no to that which is bad and say yes to that which is good. So what does it take for someone uh, for you or me to believe in the resurrection, why is it so important? What does it take to be saved? In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, Paul says, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So it's not, it's not a formula that does it for you. It's this believing faith, this true faith, believing loyalty, that if you, if you confess that Christ is Lord, that had impact. That was a... That was a public declaration. That's basically saying, 
here's my Facebook page. I'm declaring, and you can check out everything I like and everything I look at. It's a public declaration. It's a, I'm following after Jesus. If you confess with your mouth, and so it's, it's a, I'm following Christ. My loyalty has been given to Jesus. I'm not following anything else beyond Jesus. And that uh, I make sure that I'm following him and that uh, I believe in my life that, that Christ has been risen from the dead. So the power of the resurrection. So the cross, the blood, the resurrection. Did it really happen? That's why I love the historical stuff. That's why I love this book uh, about the case for, for the resurrection of Jesus and others. It gives me all kinds of, of factual evidence that I would never think of or come up with on my own. But it provides me the resources to have a conversation with someone when they say stuff like what Dr. Turek was saying earlier about, you know, just crazy uh, perceptions on what, you know, that there, everyone's, every, everything is true. You know, is that really true? That kind of thing. So, and then 1 Corinthians 15, 14, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Here's the thing. The resurrection is the key to being a Christian. If there's no resurrection, then why bother? And so you, we need to be confident that the resurrection has taken place. But if the resurrection did happen, then God is powerful, truthful, and in charge of everything. Amen. And so be confident of, about what the resurrection is. Look for historical evidence. And we have gobs and, and, and loads of, of historical evidence that supports uh, the resurrection took place. We have writers that were not Christians that that wrote in evidence of that. There's at least 10 contemporary uh, writers that, that affirm that. We have the conversion of the Apostle Paul and of, of uh, James, the brother of Jesus, that they came to faith after the resurrection. Uh, we have the empty tomb. We have the enemies affirming that the tomb was empty, and they're going, what happened to the body? We don't know where the body went. And then we have women as first witnesses, which was a, a, an attribution of embarrassment is one of the things they... They call that because women were not considered to be viable witnesses at that time. And I don't mean to diss any of the women today. So if you have any questions, talk to Lori. Uh, <laughs> but the thing is, is that, is that by them having the women be the first witnesses of the resurrection, it strengthens the, the, the claim of the resurrection because uh, women were not normally seen as being, uh, again, a viable witness. And then the early church leaders, the first generation of Christians, they all affirm the resurrection. And as, as the apostle says in that 1 Corinthians 15 passage, over more than 500 brothers and sisters in Christ saw Jesus from the time of the resurrection for those 40 days until uh, the, the ascension, until he went to be with the Father. So in that 40-day time, over 500 people saw uh, Jesus and could affirm that. And so that's pretty good historical evidence that something happened. Way better than you will get from any other uh, thing in ancient history. And so we have confidence in that. Also, if you look at Matthew 27, 28, uh, God affirmed this through miracles. So in Matthew 27, 28, you see that there's an earthquake, earthquake that happened uh, during the crucifixion. There was darkness over the land. There was the torn curtain in the temple. Uh, there were angels, there was an empty tomb, and then again, that appearance to many witnesses. So God affirms this, uh, what he says, by many eyewitnesses. Now the question is, will we believe it? Will we receive it? We have to look at this stuff from a historical, is there enough historical evidence to support it? Yeah, there's, there's just gobs and gobs of historical evidence. Will it be supported scientifically? No, but neither will any other historical event be supported his, scientifically. Okay, we got to keep that in mind. And then along with that, you have the personal stories of the people that we see in the Gospels about on the road to Emmaus, the disciples who encountered Jesus, the women at the tomb who have the uh, encounter with Jesus as well as uh, talking with the angels. We have the story of Peter who's restored by Jesus after the resurrection. We have the stories of James and Jude, the brothers of Jesus who uh, were, did not believe in Jesus until after the resurrection. And then that's when they came to faith. And then they became very prominent uh, believers in Christ. And then we see in John uh, that he says, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim 
uh, concerning the word of life that we've heard this stuff, we've seen it, we've looked at it, our hands have touched. He's just giving credible ideas about why we believe in the resurrection because we know that he's alive. We've seen it. And so even if you do believe in the resurrection, what impact will it have on your life? And that's a question we have to ask ourselves. Okay, so I believe in the cross. I believe in the blood. I believe in the resurrection. Is that changing my life somehow? Is that motivating me? Is that encouraging me to, to do something beyond my normal behavior? And that's kind of the key, isn't it? Because it's easy for us to kind of slide into a normal behavior that doesn't require a lot of ourselves. It doesn't, I don't have to engage with anybody, you know, unless they become very obviously get in my way, you know. If they're, if, if they're in front of me in their car and they have a bumper sticker and we're in, uh, we're in heavy traffic and it says, honk if you love Jesus, I will happily do that. <laughs> there, I testified to Jesus today. But if it requires me to, to go out of my way to engage with somebody, to call on the phone or to send an email or to reach out or, or hand somebody uh, a card or something, I, you know, a lot of times we hold back. But God has called us. Listen, this is probably the greatest time, one of the greatest times for the church, the people of God, to be active and involved. This is, and, and isn't it interesting that God has chosen you to be a part of this generation? For us to be engaged with people, to use your skills, to use your sphere of influence, to use your behavior to impact others. And so don't, don't run away from that. There is power in the blood of Jesus. There's power in the cross. There's power in the resurrection because we know Jesus. And so in the Bible, believing carries with, with it the idea of change. And because I believe, I follow Jesus to the best of my ability. And God wants us to be those anointed vessels used by him, those sanctified vessels to be used by him to reach out to others. And so as we move farther into this Easter season, I want to encourage you to do something that maybe you've never done before or maybe haven't done in a long time. Reach out to someone maybe that, that you don't maybe even know all that well. If they have kids, invite them to an egg hunt if they, or to church. If they... Uh, or someone that you've known has become separated from church because of COVID or because of illness or because they got hurt or their, their feelings were damaged, reach out to them and extend love and kindness and forgiveness and grace. Or just begin a conversation. It may not even be appropriate to invite them to a church thing yet because they're so hurt, they're so damaged, but begin the conversation and reach out to them. Let God use your powerful story which has become powerful because of the powerful story of Jesus. And, and let God use you to influence others. Father, we thank you for your great love. I pray that you would work in our hearts to work in our lives, God, so that we might be used by you. God, may it help our faith to grow stronger and more solid than ever before. God, that we are confident in what you're and what you're doing in our lives, and that you're confident in what you're wanting to do through our lives. And so, God, we pray that you would forgive us of our sins. Cleanse our hearts, Lord, from all the junk and all the garbage, all the stuff that we've picked up this week, maybe some things that we've been carrying around with us for a long time. Lord, may that, that garbage just be removed from us. As far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. And so, Lord, clean us up. Make us right. And then, Lord, open up our eyes to see opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. May we be proclaimers of the power of the cross, the power of the blood, the glory of the resurrection. And may people come to know you because we have the boldness to share the courage to invite. And so God, be at work in us, we pray. In Jesus' holy name, everyone says, amen. Amen. amen.